I'm uh, Nancy Parrish. I'm a, a retired di district court judge and former member of the Kansas House, and I'm here today with former uh, legislator, uh, Representative Dave Heineman, who's go going to be our videographer. Uh, we are in the House chambers and uh, here to conduct an interview that's part of the Kansas Oral History Project series examining the judicial branch of Kansas government in the last quarter of the 20th uh, century and the first decades of the 21st century. In these interviews, we're gonna be talking about the courts and their relationship to other branches of the government. Uh, today, I am pleased to interview Judge uh, Richard Walker, uh, who is also a retired district uh, judge after 30 years on the bench, and also prior to that was a legislator for uh, the term seven, like 73 through I think 77. Correct. The Kansas Oral History uh, Project is a not-for-profit corporation created to collect oral histories of Kansans who were involved in shaping and implementing public policy. And been a, a number of volunteers also here today are Joan Wagnon and Raymond Powers who have been very involved uh, in this project. And I do thank you, Judge Walker, for agreeing to contrib uh, contribute your perspective uh, to uh, uh, anyone that might be listening to this later on. <laughs> if anyone and, does. <laughs> and, and I think, I think there will be. And, but I, give me a little bit of background information about you. Uh, I don't know how far back you want to go, but, but at least uh, where you grew up and uh, how you ended up in law school. <laughs> Well, I never got very far away from home. Born and raised in Newton, Kansas. Uh, went to college at Bethel College in North Newton, Kansas. Uh, after I finished uh, my college degree in history, I thought I'd go to history graduate school. But then I talked to my major professor and he said, you know, there just aren't many jobs for history professors out there these days. And so uh, my father, who'd always wanted to go to law school but was financially uh, never able to do it, uh, said, well, why don't you give uh, uh, law school a try and uh, go a year and see how it works out, and, uh, and you may like it. You may not, in which case we'll figure something else out. But uh, So I basically did it because of um, uh, lack of uh, thoughts about uh, anything else that was going to be uh, useful in, in the future years. <laughs> not, not, high, not a high motivation process. Um. And you ran for the legislature, I believe, while you were in law school. Is I that did. correct? Uh, so yes. talk about that. I think that's particularly <laughs> interesting in how you happened to decide to run for the legislature. Well, my father had always been active indirectly in politics, uh, did a lot of uh, work. I can remember t him taking me down to the courthouse on election nights and watching uh, of course, that was when everything was hand counted and, and things would take until two or three o'clock in the morning. And so it was a real treat to be able to stay up two or three yeah. in the morning and, and watch cliffhanger races. And so it was kind of in my blood uh, to, to begin with. But uh, uh, in 1970, uh, between uh, college and law school, my dad had happened to be good friends with Kent Frizzell, who at that point was, uh, had, had, was attorney general, was running mm -hmm. for governor. And so Joe Hoagland, uh, who is another law student, and, uh, and I worked full time during the summer of 1970 down in Wichita for Kent Frizzell for governor. Well, he lost uh, to uh, Governor Docking, and, uh, but Joe and I had made the decision to go to law school, and so we wound up there, and we independently from each other simply decided that in 1972 we were going to run legislative races, and so uh, we went to uh, uh, law school. I had all my classes packed into Monday, uh, Tuesday, and Wednesday till noon. Then I drove home uh, and campaigned uh, Wednesday, uh, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, and drove back to Lawrence on, uh, on Sunday, uh, and then started the cycle all over again. So I spent uh, a lot, about half my law school during that year um, going door to door down in Newton. Now, was this your freshman or sophomore, or first year, or second year, or third year of law school? It was my second year. Second, uh, second year. year of law school, yeah, uh, okay. 1972, so. Okay, um, and you were successful? I was, I ran against a 20 year incumbent uh, and all my life I'd been hearing people say, you know, 
he really needs to be taken out or given some opposition. And even though it's a heavily Republican district, he'd almost been beaten by a Democrat because he just didn't do anything campaigning. He just relied on his uh, Mennonite name, Unruh. And, um, but he never really did anything to campaign. And a Democrat almost took him out in 1970. So I knew he was probably vulnerable. And so I actually went to him and said, okay, if, if you will commit to me uh, that you will only run for one more term and announce it's your last term, I will not run in 1972. I'll wait until 1974. He said, oh, I think I'll just serve until somebody beats me. And I said, okay. <laughs> and I went out and I beat him in the primary. Then he ran uh, in, as a write-in in the general uh, and got more votes than he did in the primary. I Actually, there were two of us, there was a Republican and a Democrat, and two write-in candidates in the uh, general election. So oh, it was wow. very, very uh, wild and crazy. Was it a cr closed race? No, I got 51% of the votes, so uh, of, of all oh, four of, of four us. Of so. the four. <laughs> so d talk about your experience in, in the legislature and, and what the climate was like then, because you, you would have been one of the younger members I was, I was, but there were a number of us like Joe Hoagland, like Sandy Duncan, uh, like Dave, uh, our videographer, who, was, uh, who were young legislators, who uh, Bob Miller, uh, or R.H., uh, I guess, because there was another Bob, Bob Miller, Miller in the legislature, <laughs> and so R.H., so a number of us, Ron Hine locally was uh, also running at that time, and uh, it was just something about the, the, the climate of frustration with the way things were. A number of us who just happened coincidentally to be running at the same time and, and, and worked hard. We just mm -hmm. didn't put our names on the ballot. Most of us committed to going door to door and running very aggressive uh, campaigns. I could buy radio announcements for 72 cents a piece back then. So uh, uh, how <laughs> times different. have changed. Right. <laughs> And what were you frustrated about? Can you share some of your frustration that you had at that time? Well, uh, part of the frustration was with our uh, local uh, representative who had been in the legislature 20 years and really hadn't had any leadership positions uh, whatsoever and had no particular uh, not uh, notoriety in terms of uh, actions. Um, I had having worked in 1970 in politics, and actually in 1968 I'd been a congressional intern back in uh, Washington, uh, I just felt that um, politics should be more hands-on, um, there should be more communication with constituents, and I, I just felt there were a lot of uh, issues concerning voting, concerning uh, consumer issues that weren't being addressed, and uh, I felt uh, uh, compelled to get involved with some of those kinds of things. And uh, I think that was a very common aspect of a number of us who were elected at the same time as younger members of the legislature. I understand there was a group called Yellow. There was, there okay. was. And uh, I think I wrote down someplace, Yellow stood for, I believe, Young Energetic Legislative Leaders Out to Win. Exactly, yeah. you got it, <laughs> so, your sources are good. <laughs> so, so tell me a little bit how that was developed and, and what the, some of the purposes were behind Yellow. Well, we obviously represented, uh, a number of us represented a younger generation, and there were a lot of old timers in the legislature at, at that point who kind of were uh, engaged in with uh, Pete McGill, who was the Speaker of the House at that time. In fact, he had the votes locked up before I even got to the legislature, never even called me to see if I would support him or anything because he didn't need to, he didn't need my vote. So he was uh, selected uh, for the 73-74 session, again for the 75-76 uh, session, and then there, were talk, there was talk that he was going to run for a third term, which was unprecedented as far as the speaker was concerned. And we just felt that a lot of the issues we concerned about weren't getting priority, uh, and so we just basically came together as, as a group of young bucks. Um, the funny story behind Yellow is uh, there was a, a, a young legislator who was our, our peer called Sandy Duncan from Wichita who had a personality, kind of a combination of uh, uh, George Carlin and Bill Maher, I, I would say. <laughs> uh, 
uh, which a lot of people didn't like, but uh, he, uh, he, I think he came up with the term yellow, and he said, that because if anybody asks you if it exists, we say, oh no, we don't know anything about it, we're, we're yellow. So <laughs> it was uh, just kind of a funny uh, aspect on things, but it was dead serious in terms of kind of organizing around the principle of it's time for a change in legislative outlook, Younger members need to have their concerns addressed, and the old boy system needs to be modified. And we, we coalesced around when the lady uh, as a leader because uh, he was uh, older, but very professional, uh, very educated, and just had a great personality uh, and, and was a, a, a clear uh, choice for a leader. Okay. Well, talk uh, about how you convinced others to support Wendell uh, Lady at, the, at that time. Uh, my understanding is that Pete ended up not running, but it must have been because he didn't have the votes, or what, or did you, you know, th somehow uh, well, uh, convince him he wouldn't be, well, ele of course, be elected? Well, of course, we lost the majority in 1976. That was the big thing. Okay. You can't be speaker if you're not in the majority. So in 1976, <clears throat> during the... Uh, which was in the immediate uh, aftermath, or two years after uh, the, the pardon of Nixon by President Ford. Governor Bennett had been elected in 1974 and was, had some popularity issues. He was elected, but he, um, uh, there was some resentment against him. He was not uh, the most popular governor, uh, even though he's probably the smartest person I ever met. Um, he he was so obviously intelligent that people some people just felt uncomfortable because of his level of intelligence. In any event, uh, the um, we lost the majority in 1976 for the first time since 1912, <laughs> uh, and so Wendell became minority leader uh, at that point, and um, uh, so that was a, a change. That now once uh, after Governor Carlin. Uh, then Speaker Carlin, uh, who was, became Speaker at that point, um, uh, served his term and then went on to the governorship. Um, then Wendell did, when the majority, I think it was maybe just for two years or four years that uh, Democrats controlled the House of Representatives, and then when it switched back, Wendell uh, did, was the, the heir apparent since he'd been minority leader. So. And so, and how was uh, Wendell Lady as as a leader? And what do you think you got accomplished during that time because of this young group of uh, of bucks, as you called them, uh, or of uh, Wendell, Wendell's uh, leadership? Well, my my knowledge only extends through 1977, so I can only talk about the the period of time when when I was closely associated uh, with him. Nancy, having served in the, the legislature, uh, you know, I think, that there are really two kinds of leaders, those who are selected because they accumulate power, and really there's a tendency to fear the consequences of defying them. Mm -hmm. um, just leadership by, uh, by, not just by example, but by presence and uh, emanation of power. There are other people who are just natural leaders because they are obviously have leadership skills. People gravitate toward them because they are friendly and uh, outgoing and knowledgeable at the same time and just have all the hallmarks of people that you like and trust. Uh, and Wendell falls in that latter category. He, his personality, he was a civil engineer, so he was highly educated, highly knowledgeable. He got along with people extremely well. Uh, he was just a natural leader, and he encouraged discussion and wanted to know what your thoughts were, as opposed to uh, most people who it's kind of a top-down situation of leadership, and you, uh, to uh, get along, you go along, uh, because you don't, uh, are worried about the consequences, and that, that, uh, that projection of power encourages you to go along because you don't want to know what the consequences of defiance would be, and you don't want... Wendell was never like that, never in my experience, and that's why, uh, because we were essentially a, a younger group, and he had, uh, a, you know, a decade on us, but he still related to us in a very very uh, meaningful kind of way in a very open way and had such natural leadership qualities 
he was an obvious choice uh, to be in that, uh, that kind of a situation. So, and then once our group clearly allied with him uh, and, and kind of put him forward, he uh, had such other obvious leadership qualities and appealed to other members who weren't as young as we are that he was, uh, uh, he was such a natural choice for, for leadership in, uh, of the Republican Party in, uh, in the House of Representatives. Can you recall uh, some high points of, of things that you personally were involved in, uh, legislation that was passed that you uh, really cared about and uh, was involved in at that time? Well, there were a lot of things that were going on in terms of restructuring, ironically, later on, restructuring the uh, judiciary, mm -hmm. uh, which would include building the Judicial Center, uh, going from uh, uh, including the option for either partisan or nonpartisan selection of judges, uh, the creation of the Court of Appeals, uh, which it, 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 I have a, a funny memory. It passed the House, as I recall, on a 63-62 vote. So when I worked with Court of Appeals judges, I said, well, but for my vote, you wouldn't exist at all <laughs> right now, which is, is, uh, is pretty funny. But the one thing I very... Um, clearly remember is Speaker McGill, and this was in 1976 when I believe it passed, Speaker McGill normally would not come down and, and take uh, personal issues on things. Mm -hmm. But he came down and he railed against creating a court of appeals and pounded the podium and just... Wow. And with the same thing with um, nonpartisan selection of judges. Uh, in my recollection, he was... Uh, he was just absolutely opposed to anything that that had to uh, was going to increase in his perception the expenses and the power of the judiciary. So um, it was a close vote. Uh, a lot of the uh, more senior members, uh, particularly if they were not fond of lawyers, and at that point there were only oh I don't know maybe ten or twelve lawyers in the mm -hmm. legislature, and it was, so it was easy to foment uh, opinion against uh, lawyers, mm -hmm. and it just passed uh, a very, uh, on a very narrow vote. So, very uh, and, and the funny thing was, too, the other thing, uh, we, we uh, built a new KU Law School. Well, I was in, enrolled in KU Law School, and the dean at that point was Martin Dickinson, and I was in his tax class at the time that, uh, uh, that um, uh, the bill was before the uh, legislature to create a new law school. So I'm convinced that my C in tax class was a reward for my vote on the <laughs> law school. <laughs> well, you would never admit it, and I, I probably shouldn't have mentioned it either, But because uh, tax was not my thing at all. <laughs> so it was pretty funny. On the one hand, he was lobbying me, and on the other hand, he, uh, had, to he had to give you. me a grade. Yeah. <laughs> so you left the legislature mm -hmm. at... Uh, at in what, 77, 78? 77, 78. Mm -hmm. And uh, went to work for Senator James Pearson. That's right. But tell, talk a little bit about that experience. Okay. <laughs> uh, in 1977, obviously, we had uh, lost the majority. So I went from being, uh, or no, 1976 election. So I went from being a committee chairman uh, in um, 1973, 70, uh, I'm sorry, 74, 75. No, let me say it again, 75, 76 to sitting back on the back row and wondering what was going to happen because we had no control over anything. Uh, and uh, it was a depressing experience. I was in a law firm uh, where I did, I did not particularly enjoy practicing law on a day-to-day -day basis and I was gone so much it was hard to, uh, to keep good contact with clients. Um, and I, frankly, I was in a general state of depression at that point about the, the whole things. And when uh, Pearson's representative called me up and, and asked me if I'd be interested in, because he was scheduled to be uh, up for re-election in 1978. And so they said, what we'd like you to do is come back to Washington and spend some time here and then come back and help run our 78 re-election thing. Well, so I left my law practice. I resigned from the legislature. I sold my house. I got engaged to be married wow. <coughs> and moved to Washington, D.C., all within you made a few a months. You kind of changes. And I got went. back there and found out that he had changed his mind and was not going to run for re-election. So, oh, so it was short-lived. Well, um, 
uh, he was obviously going to be in office for another year and a half, mm -hmm. so I stayed uh, through most of that, although I, uh, I came back in, in 1978 because cost of living in Washington was really a, a serious issue, and um, I just didn't enjoy life in Washington. We missed Kansas, mm -hmm. and because... Uh, Were you married by that time? Yes, I uh, mm -hmm. got married in actually November of 1977, but uh, uh, we... Uh, had originally lived in Washington D.C. and then moved out to uh, the suburb of Maryland, and uh, but everything was just so incredibly expensive. Couldn't get good meat. <laughs> we missed <laughs> Kansas beef, <laughs> and uh, so and my old law firm said, "Well, if you want to come back." Uh, plus, at that point, I had been talking. That was in 1978, and I had been talking with Governor Bennett, uh, who whose term was up in '78 about being appointed to the newly created Kansas Adult Authority, which was uh, the, the parole board. And there were full-time positions available. And uh, I asked him if he'd consider appointing me, and he said, sure. And, uh, uh, but this was, he appointed me after he had lost the election to Governor Carlin. <laughs> which, which, uh, but Governor Carlin and I had had a good working relationship when he was Speaker of the House and when he was a member of the uh, uh, legislature. We'd worked on a number of things. We'd uh, ironically both uh, worked to oppose the death penalty. Although later running for governor, he announced he was, going, he was in favor of the death penalty, wound up vetoing it though uh, as a matter of conscience when it did hit his desk, which uh, I teach political science classes and I use that as an example of true political courage, saying something that uh, be, because uh, Governor Carlin realized and was put to him, you realize when you sign this bill, people will die because of it. And he hadn't really thought about it that way. And I've talked to him several times about that, but it's, uh, so he and I worked uh, on a lot of things together across the aisle. Mm -hmm. And so he, he and I had a great deal of respect for one another, despite obviously belonging to different political parties. So, so he was supportive of your appointment absolutely. to the Kansas Absolutely, he Adult indicated Academy. there there were uh, three appointments uh, uh, all Republicans. Mm -hmm. He did not oppose me, but he opposed the other two, and they uh, they were non-confirmed by the by the Senate. So, so wow. And so, how long did you serve on uh, the Adult Authority? I served uh, three and a half years, uh, three years, eight months, something like that. And then, uh, at that time, um, uh, there were bad things happening. Uh, the practices of the board had changed dramatically so that um, instead of everybody reviewing all the files and everybody up for parole, uh, one person would interview them and then they'd pass the file around and once they got three of the five signatures, they'd just cut a parole certificate and the other two members might not even know about it. Uh, and I caught one, happened to just be in the office of the clerk uh, when he was issuing a parole certificate, and I said, I don't remember seeing this. He said, well, I got three, two other signatures beside the, and I said, this isn't right. But they kept on doing it because that's how the chair wanted to do it, and uh, I could see disaster coming, uh, particularly one particular inmate who we uh, continued, uh, but when I left, they paroled him, and he went out and murdered again. So I, I knew that was going to come. I could just see, uh, I could see disaster, and I got out before the Titanic hit the iceberg. Yeah. Obviously, really, some serious, difficult oh, decisions. Oh, it was terrible. There. It was terrible. Difficult. So, and, and you went from that, and then, I don't know how many years later, but you applied for a, a judgeship. Mm -hmm. Actually, twice. Uh, the first time, uh, there was, and this was, uh, oh, 1970. 17, uh, no, it was 1984, there was a vacancy. I applied for that, but there was a very well-connected Democrat, uh, and Carlin uh, ha had no real choice but to appoint him, so I knew that. But he did not like the job. He resigned a couple of years later, so in 1984 uh, I applied, and uh, uh, he appointed me o over uh, another Republican. So. And you had that working relationship Absolutely. with him from before. In so fact, that was I was real concerned about it, but uh, I walked into Governor Carlin's office and said, well, you've, you've got the appointment. I'm going to appoint you, but tell me about how things are going down in Newton. <laughs> <laughs> it was a real stress reliever. <laughs> so you were on the bench for 30, 30 Almost 31 years. Yeah, 30 plus years. Uh, 
Talk about that. I mean, you, I mean, you are one of very few people that have really been in all three branches mm -hmm. of the government, the legislative, the executive, through, as, the, um, as a member of the right. Kansas Adult Authority, and then as a, a judge, and different responsibilities for different uh, branches Absolutely. of the government. But talk about being a judge, and you can comment on the, the differences uh, that you felt uh, sure. Sure. Uh, in those different positions. One of the differences, uh, one of the reasons that I wanted to be a judge, really, really two, two reasons, is when you are in private practice of law, as I was for a while, sometimes you have to represent people that you really find disagreeable, but if they pay cash, I mean, you need to uh, take things on that, uh, because you need the, the money to, to function. And I was never real good about billable hours. Sometimes I'd work all day hard on something, maybe spend eight or 10 hours. I'd only figure out two or three billable hours because I was a terrible timekeeper. And I always did not like the fact that my ability to help somebody was dependent upon their ability to pay. And one of the things that I decided early on was, I, first of all, I was never going to make a lot of money, but when I was in law practice, there were some months where the firm didn't even bring in, uh, it was feast or famine. Some months we didn't even bring in enough money to distribute out for me to make my mortgage payment. <laughs> uh, other months was better, but uh, I liked being a judge because I didn't have to worry about, number one, billing hours and keeping track of my time. Number two, I didn't have to think about now, can I afford to charge this person, or can this person aff afford to pay me what? Uh, uh, because in a small town practice where it's essentially retail law and you don't represent a lot of big clients, you know, billing is is your life, and mm -hmm. and uh, you don't have a lot of big retainers, and and uh, if you're not keeping track of your time and aggressively billing, you're not going to do well. And I didn't do well practicing law. But I just enjoyed the idea that I had an opportunity, particularly because we tried a lot of jury trials. We had a prosecutor who wouldn't negotiate, so I tried a lot of jury trials, to showcase the legal system to the public and demonstrate to them that it's not our system of judges and lawyers, it's their system. Mm -hmm. And they're the ones, when we get down to the most important decisions, they're the ones that have to make it work. And so. Uh, the goodwill you can you can bring about because most people fear jury duty, have bad experiences, uh, or have heard about people that have bad experiences. But if you can convince people by when they participate, as we did for a lot of jury trials down in the Ninth Judicial District, that the system is really operated by them when we get down to the the, the, the most important things in in the system, uh, that was very fulfilling. Uh, I enjoyed that that piece of it. Did not enjoy the domestic work. In fact, that's one of the reasons why I left. I had one too many just ugly child support, uh, not ch uh, child custody Tested decisions. Yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> you make there. a decision and then there are more motions and there are more decisions and more motions and just never, never go ends. away. Never um, ends. And, but we really were aggressive about promoting alternatives, uh, both mediation and uh, high impact um, divorce education to convince parents how not to fight because all the studies showing how um, when parents fight that's the single most toxic effect on children uh, in, in their younger years and it sets a role model that how, that's how you resolve uh, disputes as you fight uh, with each other. If you can teach people how not to fight and alternatives and the the, it, the emotional cost of fighting mm -hmm. if, they, if, they can, if they can understand that then, then they can figure out alternatives. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that you were opposed to the death penalty Absolutely. when you were in the legislature. Did you ever have a death penalty case as a judge? I did, uh, but, um, well, first of all, you had to, uh, and I, I don't know whether this is still true or not, you had to go through death school uh, as, as a mm -hmm. judge, at least back uh, when the death penalty came in. You had to go through death jury trial training in order to handle a case. Had one involved a very um, well-liked uh, officer uh, who was murdered during a, a SWAT raid on a, a drug house. Um, but he was loved by everybody and um, I was originally assigned the case 
but I knew him really well. And uh, first of all, I uh, granted a change of venue because he was so popular, so well liked mm -hmm. uh, that uh, I knew that it would be very, very difficult to get a jury in uh, Newton. Um, and so I um, ordered a change of venue and I also recused from the case and they appointed a Sedgwick County judge to handle it. And uh, uh, then it was tried down in uh, uh, Wichita. So I had a couple assigned to me, but one, uh, there was another one which pled out uh, to uh, a non-death penalty case. So fortunately I never had to, I would have had a moral dilemma and I, I thought about this. Uh, what would I do? if I was assigned a case and didn't, and didn't have a conflict, um, at some point I would have resigned rather than handle a death penalty. You I, felt I, I was prepared to resign. I felt so strongly. And it's not just, uh, that's a whole bunch of things. It's, it's obviously background, moral belief, but it's also um, the knowledge that the death penalty uses so many resources, number one, but it's, that's not the, the, the reason. It doesn't make society safer by, by killing people. In fact, the states that have death penalties have, normally have higher crime rates than those that don't have uh, death penalties. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's no, uh, th there's no cause and effect. Plus, death penalty cases just consume so many resources. They're, they're cruel, uh, particularly to the victims, because they string out over 20, 25 years and you don't really know the, the outcome of things. So there are a whole bunch of reasons it's a bad thing. So as members of uh, the judiciary, we, you know, we do believe you know, that we have a good system. However, it's not perfect either, and I think that, that is also a, a consideration. You uh, gave a quote uh, upon your retirement from the bench uh, about your view of, uh, of uh, certain people being supervised in the community rather than being incarcerated. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Because uh, I think that goes maybe along with some of your other sure, views, having sure. been on the parole board and having been other places, you know, and your, you know, your uh, experience in the legislature as well. When I was, one of the first couple of years I was on the parole board, the Kansas Adult Authority, the Judiciary Committee of the uh, House decided that uh, they were going to see what was going on in the prison. Why are all these uh, people being let out of uh, prison? And so we actually had a meeting over at Lansing Correctional Facility, and we just had them sit in on a typical panel of uh, inmates that were eligible for parole that month. First case was uh, bad checks. Mm -hmm person convicted of bad checks. Second case was a lower level theft with no prior record. Uh, out of, I think they sat through like a dozen hearings, 10 of which were nonviolent people, some of whom had no record whatsoever. Now, a couple of them were bad dudes and we, we, didn't, we kept them in prison. But the legislative panel members, the judicial panel members said to us, why are these people here? Well, in most cases, it's because the local judge got tired of seeing him around for petty stuff and said, I'm going to fix your wagon. I'm going to send you to prison mm -hmm. um, without really trying them on any kind of um, intense supervision because there were no intensive supervision programs back then. Community corrections at that point did not exist. Yeah. Um, so it was either, and I know in our county, uh, before I became judge, um, if you were on probation, you signed a piece of paper, and that was pretty much it. You, you, you didn't report. Oh, if, if something was going on that they got a report, the probation officer might call you in, but there was not, no meaningful supervision of any kind, let alone intensive supervision uh, of people. So uh, it was easy for judges to, to get upset at, parole, at probationers who continually violated things, and then when when they finally got enough, they sent them to prison, even though uh, they could have easily uh, been uh, kept in the community. And if a, a typical sentence was one to five years. A one to five year sentence didn't mean one, and it didn't mean five. You could see the parole board at 10 months, and the parole board could let you out or pass you on. You might do 10 months, you might do all five years if you, uh, not, if you loused up your time in prison. If I say I'm coming to your house, I might be there 10 months or I might be there five years. How do you, how do you even plan for 
uh, if, if you're state government, how do you, how do you it was dishonest for the inmates because they never knew when they were going to get out. Uh, it was dishonest for the victims because they never knew when the offender was going to get out. It was dishonest to the state because we didn't know how to budget for, for people. And we had burgeoning populations. But the majority of people in prison when I was on the parole board were there for nonviolent offenses. 60% of people, and they were serving short times, they were continually rotating in and out, but they, they really needed to be tried with resources in the community. Well, there weren't resources in the community to, to deal with them. So the creation of community corrections, the creation of sentencing guidelines, and I was one of the original members of the, the Sentencing Commission, and I'm, that's one of the things I'm proudest of that I was able to work on and help accomplish where we, we said, look, we need to give judges flexibility, so we need to create a presumptive system, but that's more honest, that, mm -hmm. that says you're going to serve X amount of time depending upon your criminal history, depending upon the severity of your offense, you're going to be given a number, you can earn good time off of that, but then everybody knows within a short range of time, including the prison system and the legislature, mm -hmm. how much uh, time is, is likely to be spent, mm -hmm. and then we can project it out. And we, on the Sentencing Commission, developed some very sophisticated models for prediction. Okay, if we double the penalty for this, what's it going to do a year from now? What's it going to do five years from now? How much space are you going to need uh, in 10 years? Uh, uh, how much additional construction are you going to have to do to accommodate just because you're uh, uh, increasing the penalty for this particular crime? And they've turned about to be highly reliable uh, models for prediction of prison population. So it, it's a source of information for the legislature. It, it, it creates a normative situation for judges where there can be departures away from things, and there are a lot, uh, yeah. as you know. Yes, I know. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but it, it's, a, it's a normative system instead of one that's based upon a worst case scenario and giving judges unlimited authority to send people to prison, plus giving them community resources to use for, for people who need uh, management in the community. I understand you had some creative uh, sentencings from time to time. Can you recall any of those? Well, um, a couple of situations we had uh, a, a bunch of... Uh, boys who got uh, a sack full of BBs, not, not BBs, uh, ball bearings, and a slingshot, and they went around town taking out plate glass windows to the tune of like $20, $25,000. And included about uh, both homeowners and businesses, something like 15 different businesses. Well, there was no way they could pay uh, that back yeah. in cash. So we had them sit down uh, with, with mediators and they worked out a situation. In some cases they mowed lawns, some cases they actually went to the business. They, they were not bad kids, but they just made some incredibly, here's a bag of, uh, of doll bearings, wouldn't it be fun to shoot out some windows in, in kind of a, a group setting? And so we actually arranged for them to meet with all of the business owners, all of the owners, some of them, a few wouldn't participate, but most of them would. And they worked out uh, in-kind restitution, some dollar restitution, wrote letters of apology, apologized in person. It was really a community healing uh, kind of a situation. Other cases, I, I had uh, a situation where uh, we had a, a revenge kind of a situation, and I made the people not only sit down, but I, I made them uh, read Walter Van Tilburg Clark's uh, The Oxbow Incident, where vengeance uh, runs amok and what the, what the uh, cost of that is. And uh, so uh, in another case, I had uh, animal abuse, and I made them uh, involve cruelty to horses. And the argument was, well, I, I, it was stupidity. It wasn't uh, cruelty, although they were convicted, and I made them uh, take some training and meet with veterinarians so they would understand horse care. So next time, if it happened again, they wouldn't come in and say, well, I didn't know uh, anything about horses, that, that they would do that. So, yeah, I, I always required letters of apology. I always required uh, uh, that there be some kind of community service work associated with every probation order. Uh, it could be volunteer work. It could be all kinds of different things, unless there was some physical disability that prevented it. But... Um, it was very important to me that, that people who are on probation understand not just the cost to the victim, but the cost to the community and the need to pay back the community. Okay. 
Um, just moving to just uh, kind of a more general question, uh, and I, I guess I don't know whether the Ninth Judicial District, I assume, or I'm thinking it's a nonpartisan selection. That's correct. And Has been from a, the beginning. Okay. Any thoughts about that system uh, uh, in contrast to election of judges? Were you involved in any issues regarding that at any time? No. Either I look in at, the legislature while you were on the bench? You know, I'm 20 miles away from Wichita where they spend incredible sums of money running in the primary. In fact, I asked an attorney, said, if I wanted to run a, a primary campaign uh, against one of the incumbent judges down there, how much money would I have to raise? Oh least fifty thousand dollars and then if I had a general election oh at least another fifty seventy five thousand uh, dollars just to run in a partisan election in in Sedgwick County because TV and billboards and, and all that kind of thing to get your name out um, in 31 years in nonpartisan uh, selection I never spent a penny never spent a penny and I didn't have to worry about uh, is this attorney contributing to me and because attorneys no, uh, and and judges know who's contributing, and, and and I always wondered. And who's not? Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And some contribute to all the candidates, just to be just safe. True. Well, that's just not a system because I always wondered because I, I I never practiced even though I when I was in private practice I I didn't go out of district much because the one time I did, which ironically was here in Shawnee County. I got hometown so badly by the by the local <laughs> judge. Well, he has passed on to his the big bench in the sky. Uh, but I, I really did. I got hometown so that I vowed I would never again put my a client of mine in a situation where I went before a judge I didn't know or, and I didn't know the legal culture because the thing I've discovered as a, as a senior judge in, in traveling the state as as you are uh, is that we have uh, one system of justice. But we've got 150, 105 counties, different ways of doing things than this, to make that system work. And, and some of them are radically different from each other. And just because I did things one way, that's, that's not done here. So, um, so I've had to uh, be quite flexible. Uh, I, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> I know you know what I mean. I do mean. <laughs> want to ask you about your time serving as a senior judge on mm -hmm. the Court of Appeals. How many years did you do that? Seven. Okay, um, so that's a whole different experience oh, totally too. totally different. Uh, working with the uh, working as an appellate court judge, and that was immediately after your retirement. Yes. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, in fact, I might not. Have, I could have actually served another nine years had I not re retired. But just by the vagaries of the retirement law, I could have mm -hmm. served. Uh, uh, in fact, I could still be be serving right now, but. Um, I'd had it with the domestic cases, and this came about, and I'd, through the years, I'd almost put my name in half a dozen times as an appellate judge, but I, I didn't want to move to Topeka. I, I thought you had to do that. Apparently, you don't have to. We didn't uh, know that. I, did, I didn't know it, uh, <laughs> yeah. but some of the chief judges had actively recruited me to put my name in for it, and I just, I don't know, I had kids in school, and I didn't, I, I didn't want to, uh, I, I just didn't. Uh, so, but I'd always kind of enjoyed, I'd been assigned in, ironically, as a, as a district judge to help out, mm -hmm. well, I think eight or nine times wow. during that, that period of time and had a, a number of published decisions and I enjoyed it. I particularly enjoyed the opportunity to work in a panel of judges because when you're a lone wolf, as, as you know, uh, particularly if you're in a, a district where, um, a small district where there's... Uh, people know you and, where people and know you know you. them. It's, it's, it's not always easy to, uh, to get a judge as familiar with the case to be able to give you useful advice. But when you're sitting, all three judges sitting on the panel, even if you've got the writing assignment, you get feedback from all the judges, you have to give and take. Uh, and uh, and I know you've you've gone through that process. That's number one. So you have the benefit of group thinking. Number two, for the first time in my life, I had research as, uh, assistance. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm a pretty good researcher on my own. But when you've got you know, a couple of dozen cases, you just don't have time to dig into depth. You make a decision, usually from the bench, or, or maybe uh, you know with a a little bit of research, but you rely on the attorneys for most of the research. 
although that's not always the best thing to do. No, because they, I always would find cases that they had overlooked. But the ability to have really top quality law law students and former law students who are at the top of their game, giving you legal research, pretty much on demand. I'd say, you know, I really need something more on this issue, and say. Oh, well, I can't get to it today, but I can get it first thing in the morning. It's so quick. <laughs> I mean, it was just unbelievable to, to have that kind of, of backup mm -hmm. uh, in making my decisions on things. I'd never had that before, and it was, it was intoxicating. <laughs> uh, and you've done some other things. You've, been, you've taught since retirement. Are I've taught at Bethel for the last 22 years as an adjunct, okay. uh, mm -hmm. night classes, uh, all the way from Kansas history, intro to political science, um, U.S. government, uh, criminology. Right now I'm teaching uh, introduction to criminal justice. Uh, I like working with people who don't know much about the system, so I at least know a little more than they do. You have a few stories <laughs> to tell, I, I, I would say. You know, I have to... I, I have to limit myself to one war story per class session because... Yeah, that's the part they probably enjoy the most, though. And, and I mean, you have been a public servant, you know, and your entire, it sounds like, your entire uh, adult life. Uh, and, and when you look at those various phases that you were in or various branches of the government, do you have th is something that sticks out that we haven't already talked about that you'd like to, to mention? What, you know, proud moment, uh, something that, uh, that, uh, that you carry with you. The, the, big, the, the thing I'm, uh, I'm, I'm proudest of is the fact that we've been able to create down in the 9th Judicial District, and actually it's attracted uh, people from other uh, districts too, is what we call HOPE healthy opportunities for parenting effectively, which is the program I talked about where we actually require parents to come in high conflict cases. Mm -hmm. you, you, you don't they need it in every them. case, yeah. but where the people who keep coming back and keep coming back and think that hiring lawyers and filing motions and, 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 and bombarding the other party and forcing them to come to court all the time, that that's, that's the way you do things. Um, created a program that is a five-week program where we actually confront them with the statistics about the damage they're doing to their children. We have uh, several couples who have gone through it and who have gone from motion of the month club down at the district court yeah. to, they don't like each other anymore, but they show up together and say, oh, we understand now how important it was that we cooperate. People understand that you can change from totally hating and oppos being oppositional to everything the former spouse wants to, well, we may not like each other, but we understand we've, we've, we've got a co-parent here, and, and we've got to do it in a way that does not make them the victims of, uh, of our broken marriage. Mm -hmm. uh, that, they, that you learn in the toughest situations that you will ever face that there are constructive ways to get through it that will not scar the people that you love the most. Mm -hmm. And if you love them, you'll learn how to do that. If you don't, then just keep on fighting. So... I guess maybe just kind of uh, toward the end of our conversation together, um, uh, we, talk, we haven't talked much about your family and the impact on your family, particularly being a judge in a small community. Uh, anything you might, might want to mention? I don't know how many, how many children you have, and well, you want to just mention a few things <laughs> like that. Well, we're a hers, mine, and ours uh, situation. Yeah. I had uh, uh, two children by m in my practice marriage. Uh, <laughs> And then uh, I married a woman who had two children in her practice marriage. And uh, then we actually met in um, uh, taking our kids to the babysitter in, in Newton. And uh, we got married and we've had, uh, we've had one child uh, since that time. So uh, um, uh, parenting has been and continues to be uh, a challenge because some of the children that we've had adapted much better to, uh, my children were quite young when I uh, was divorced, uh, and um, as were my wife's and uh, children uh, quite young. Some of them have had a, a rough ride. Now, uh, the child we had together is doing quite well and is well-adjusted, but uh, 
you know, some of them have had struggles uh, mm -hmm. just because um, it's, it's never, particularly because um, uh, my first wife moved away out of state and well, first of all, she moved to Lawrence and I spent every weekend driving back and forth. She said, uh, if you want to see your kids, you, you drive to uh, I, I remember Lawrence. seeing you at a baseball game. Yes, it, absolutely. I drove back and forth. I mean, yeah. round, two round trips to, to Lawrence every weekend for about four years. Then, uh, then she moved mm -hmm. to, to Dallas and I tried to get down there once a month to, to see the kids. And, uh, but, um, so do some of those experiences only helped yeah. you on the bench to understand what some of well, these families were going through too? What it does is people who, I have to fight with, with, with my emotions because people who are intolerant and won't even drive across town and you drove to Dallas. Yeah, yeah, and, <laughs> and I drove to and, Dallas and, and back yeah, once a month. I, I have to fight, okay, I did it, uh, you know, why can't you do it? Well, there are a number of reasons, but and particularly people who are not willing to, um, here's a saying that, that, uh, uh, that we discovered in the HOPE program. Just because I have the right to do something in court or to oppose something, doesn't mean it's the right thing to do, which is kind mm -hmm. of a glib way of saying, you shouldn't always demand your way and you've got to be flexible even, uh, there's another term, heroic self-restraint. Mm -hmm. You have to be heroically self-restrained and not do things even when it's, maybe when it's, it. when, when you could do them, maybe even should do them, but you have to always ask the question, Will this make life better for the kids? I mean, will it enhance their life or will it penalize them? And a lot of families aren't able to, 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 to jump over the anger barricade or the, well, uh, it's, it's my, it's your turn to do something or, well, if you're not gonna do it, then I'm not gonna. You have to be willing to um, give a lot sometimes for, and so I, I have to fight with myself because I went through a lot of the same things that the people are appearing in front of me. And uh, the fact that uh, somebody was 30 minutes late for visitation, now you want to terminate their visitation. Um, and, so. and, yeah. and as you know, there are attorneys who will feed that fire uh, because mm -hmm. that's how they make their living. Uh, most attorneys, that's not true. Most of the members of the bar, particularly in family uh, law matters, will try to understand the stakes, mm -hmm. but there are our core of people who make money by stoking the flames and by filing those motions and getting hearings. All I need is 15 minutes, Judge. Well, an hour and a half later, when, when they're still presenting their evidence, we haven't yeah. even got to the other side, um, and you know, you know that. Uh, and it's just not the right way to handle things. The worst place in the world to handle family uh, law disputes is in the courtroom. Absolutely the worst place. I agree with you. I agree with Absolutely. you. Absolutely. But you've got, to, you've got to show them and convince them that there are alternatives to that, mm -hmm. that, are, that are meaningful and that everybody's going to be better off. Because a judge can just make a decision. I can't live your life uh, afterwards, after that decision is mm -hmm. made. Uh, and, uh, and sometimes it's going to make things worse. It could be a fallout. Because you've turned, you've turned the children's lives over to me now. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm the super parent now. So... And that isn't the way it should be, but a lot of... Anything that I haven't asked you that you would like to, uh, to talk about? Uh, anything that, that I've missed as far yeah, as... Yeah, we I'm... haven't talked about what a joy it was to serve with your husband in the legislature. So. <laughs> well, I, will, boy, I will certainly <laughs> tell him that. And when my first... First year in the legislature, I actually rented uh, from him in a, in a oh. building that's now tor been torn down, <laughs> or it may have fallen down. I don't know. Next which. to McDonald's. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I, I remember that building. I do too. I collected rent over there, not from you, but from other people. Anything else? That... One of my favorite pictures occurred right here, where I'm expounding on something and Jim is sitting patiently, uh, uh, listening to me patiently like this, waiting to reply. So it's, <laughs> I've got a big blow up of that. It's oh, my I'd love to favorite, see favorite that. picture. And I have hair that's almost down past my ears and it's, uh, it was a real 70s picture. So, yeah. and, a, and a vest and a bright uh, tie and it was, it was a whole There's different a, time. Those old pictures are fun. 
Anything else? No. Okay. No. Well, I want to thank you very much. Well, thank you, uh, Judge Nancy. Walker, it's been a delight to talk with you. I, I could do, I could talk for another couple sure. of hours or so, but I, I very much enjoyed it. So thank you very much. Okay.